Elizabeth Kendall is a senior research fellow at Oxford University, and she joins me now from London to talk a bit more about the situation in Yemen. Elizabeth, thanks for joining us. This pullout coming from both sides now, from the Iran-backed Houthi movement and the Saudi-backed government, could this be a real breakthrough to finally ending the war in Yemen? It's certainly a breakthrough in terms of the Stockholm Agreement that was reached in December not collapsing. There's a very long way to go before we have actual peace in Yemen. But last week, things looked much bleaker. Last week, we had a statement by the Saudi-led coalition which showed a distinct end of patience with the Stockholm Agreement. Remember, it's been about two months since that was made, and very little progress has happened on any of the articles in it. The ceasefire had been violated, according to the coalition, about 1,400 times by the Houthis, and the Houthis alleged similar. So it did look like it was perhaps going to collapse. Today's statement by the United Nations that there has now been agreement on redeployment of forces, at least for the first phase, is extremely welcome. Elizabeth, just remind our viewers, uh, this situation in Yemen has been described as the absolute worst uh, from a humanitarian standpoint in the world. How bad are things there really for Yemenis? Things are extremely bad, particularly in the west and the north of the country. We have about 24 million Yemenis who are in need of humanitarian assistance. That's over 80 percent of the population, and about 10 million of them are on the brink of starvation. They've suffered this war now for, for about four years. And really, until Stockholm last year, there was no breakthrough in talks. We hadn't had talks for two years. So the UN and other world powers have to hang on to what was achieved in Stockholm in order to give Yemenis a bit of a break from the seemingly never-ending war. Last week, the U.S. House of Representatives voted to end U.S. military support for Saudi Arabia in Yemen. What kind of effect will that have on the ceasefire? The fact that U.S. lawmakers came down so heavily in condemning U.S. military support for the Saudi-led coalition in Yemen means that there's extreme international pressure now on the Saudi-led coalition to stick by the Stockholm Agreement and hopefully also to further it. It shows that there is no international appetite remaining for this war to drag on and that those who had been in support of the Saudi-led coalition are now trying to distance themselves for it, from it. So what that tells us is that we have strong international concern, which will continue to put pressure not just on the Houthis, but on the Saudi-led coalition to stick by the agreements they've made. Elizabeth, what happens next if there is lasting peace? So what will the next challenges be for Yemen as a country? Well, that's an excellent question, because even if the peace that's currently envisaged between the two main warring sides, the Houthis and the Yemeni government backed by the Saudi-led coalition, that will not necessarily translate into peace on the ground, because there are so many warring factions in Yemen. Indeed, one of the main concerns now is that if the major warring sides make peace, then the mutual enemies that were keeping together all the different factions within those two main warring sides may fracture, which may mean that we have a multiple set of conflicts that start to break out on the ground. So, in parallel to this major peace effort between the two main warring sides, there must be talks on the side which bring in all the other stakeholders and ensure that peace can be rolled out on the ground. Of particular concern, is the young generation. I have to highlight this because we have over 2 million Yemeni children out of school and a whole generation of youth who've known nothing but war for the last four years. So steps must be made to prepare this next generation to help rebuild Yemen if it's, if it's to have a future and stand on its own two feet. So what exactly should the international community be focusing on to try and help those children, for example? I think we have to be focusing on not waiting for the end of the war, not waiting for peace to roll out on the ground, but acting now to try to pump money into the failing economy so that families are able to buy food, try to alleviate the humanitarian crisis, and try to pump money into the education system, pay teachers' salaries, and stabilize all the little communities, especially in the west of Yemen, where people are displaced where children have been perhaps orphaned, 
in order to make sure that we don't end up with a crisis that simply snowballs and gets worse and worse. We cannot afford to wait until the war proper has ended.